Well, hello and welcome to another edition of No Nonsense with Pamela Wallen. So let's talk about April 1st, and this is no joke. The carbon tax is going up. I think the number will be 23%, but what that means for individuals uh, can be really quite dramatic. This is um, an interesting move because, of course, it was the government itself that uh, conceded that the carbon tax does have an impact on affordability on families, which is why they gave Atlantic Canadians a break on home heating. But when the Saskatchewan government said, okay, we're not going to collect the carbon taxes on home heating in Saskatchewan because you took them off other people, the Minister of Energy said it was anarchy in Canada. So we are going to have this discussion about where we're going with carbon taxes one more time. Brian Zinchuk, he is the editor and owner of Pipeline Online, a website on Saskatchewan's energy news, founded in 2021. But he's kind of a big picture energy guy too, or I think as we called you the last time, and you seem to like the title, a bit of an energy geek. Uh, nerd would uh, go oh with nerd the okay all we'll the above go with, we'll go with nerd we'll go with nerd all right so this tax is uh, goes ahead April first um, we've had discussions with people that say you know what high low it at least gives the business world predictability and we know what we're counting on but I'm not sure it does when we see different rules for different folks in different parts of Canada but. We do know this is going to have an impact on everybody. Oh, absolutely. And, and that's, a, that's a feature. That's not a bug. The entire purpose of the, uh, the carbon tax was to make using anything that burns anything uh, more expensive. So you use less of it until the point where you stop using it. Well, yeah. it's pretty hard to do that when your heating systems for well over half the country are natural gas. Uh, yeah. I do my dad's uh, finances. I think I mentioned this to you last time. And for a while there, he had a shop. The shop's now, the neighbors have bought it. But he was, uh, for a medium-sized shop, uh, which would be very typical on any farm or anything like that, yep. minimally heated. Uh, he was paying $700 a, a month in wintertime for, for gas bills. And a huge chunk of that was a carbon tax. I mean, right now, uh, if the Saskatchewan government had not removed carbon tax, the and, and anyone who looks at their Sask Energy, which is our natural gas utility in Saskatchewan, if you look at those bills, you find that the price of natural gas is just about equal to the carbon tax. Yeah. And after April 1st, the carbon tax will exceed that. So you have to ask yourself, you know, why am I being punished for keeping my house warm and hot water and keeping grandma warm, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just for the sake of living? How can I possibly make that go away? The uh, federal government has been saying, oh, well, we'll just put heat pumps in and heat pumps will run off electrical. Well, we don't have the electrical capacity to put everyone on heat pumps, number one. Number two, they might work in Atlanta, Canada, where uh, it doesn't get much below minus 25. Minus yeah. 25 is a warm day in Wadena. Yeah, for sure it is. Uh, so they don't really work. I mean, I I, I know people in the city and, in, uh, and even uh, other areas in Ontario that have put them in. Again, because you by and large have a more moderate climate. But they don't really work in places like Saskatchewan. So the, the whole concept of the carbon tax was we're going to create some market pricing and we're okay. going to... We're going to make what we want undesirable, more expensive until people stop using it. Well, the electric vehicles have not come in in a way to replace all the gasoline vehicles, and we don't have the infrastructure to support that yet, but not by a long shot, nor will we. We don't have the heating, and then there's the whole issue of uh, commercial carbon tax as well. Yeah. The, the whole idea was to make things more expensive. That was the entire purpose of a carbon tax. I want to keep ratcheting it up. First, they said it'll be 20, then 30, then 40, then 50. To change behavior. And then the, the double down, they said, we're going to increase it by $15 a ton. So it went from 50 to 65. And then this April 1st, will be $80 a ton. Well, people all of a sudden are noticing this is significant. Well, my, I'm paying more in my natural gas bill for carbon tax than I am for natural gas. That's a huge uh, burden on me. 
And I can't change that behavior. Maybe I can reduce my driving a little bit, but I can't reduce my heating. So this is exactly what the government wanted. They wanted to make things more expensive. They don't want to say it's inflation, it's, but that's what it got. It is. It's, I don't know whether it's going to change behavior because as you say, I mean, you might be able to drive a little less, but, but not if you drive to work. Um, and in a, I, you know, if I fly home from Ottawa and go to Saskatchewan, I have to drive on the highway for three hours. There's no bus to take. There's no transit. There's no bicycle. There's no anything that would allow me to do that. So I can change some behavior, but I can't change that basic behavior, nor can we change heating our homes or trying to cool them in the summer when temperatures are extreme. Well, I think uh, economists would call that inelastic behavior. You know, mm -hmm. it's going to happen no matter what. So yeah. it is happening no matter what. The carbon tax is coming on. And uh, Dixon DeLorme, who is also known as Quick Dick McDick, he did a video oh, last, yes. last year. And it's actually one of the best examples I've seen from a Saskatchewan perspective of how the carbon tax is inflationary when it comes to food. So he talked about how, okay, uh, the carbon tax isn't applied necessarily for the fuel you put in your combine, but for the guy who uh, the grain terminal contracts show up with the B train, he's paying carbon tax. And then it gets grain to drying. grain drying, uh, you know, the, uh, what do you call it? The electrical bill and the drying bill for the grain terminal, well, that's all carbon tax. And then when it gets sent to a processor, let's say grain millers in uh, Yorkton, you know, they're paying carbon tax on all their natural gas they use for their processing and heating the building and the electrical, uh, they're paying yep. carbon tax for that. And then, you know, when it gets shipped into a commercial product, well, it goes on a truck and that truck's paying carbon tax. And then it goes to Superstore and Superstore is paying carbon tax on its heating and its power. And then all of a sudden, you come and get to it. And yet carbon tax has now been applied, what, six, seven times? Yeah. And it's increasing at every level. Tax so, on tax on tax on tax. And, and um, I think the, the biggest thing about the carbon tax, and we've heard a lot of talk about, oh, well, the rebate is this and it's equal to what it is. Nowhere in those discussions do you actually hear anyone talk about the fact that businesses don't get any rebate. Yeah. So if you are a dirt moving company or if you are a, uh, a grocery store, you don't get any rebate on that. So you're paying for heating your building. You're paying for everything. Uh, I grew up uh, at, at the village of Hyas. Hyas uh, just uh, recently sold its hull because it was not being used much anymore. And mm -hmm. uh, the natural gas bill was just killing them. Yeah. So they basically well, almost gave it away as a result. That that's the problem. And I mean, I don't, despite the protestations of the government, I mean, we even hear from the parliamentary budget officer that the, in many, many, many cases, the rebate doesn't come close to the outlay. And that's the direct outlay, not you, as you say, all the other layers in which it's embedded in the price of food or, or the guy moving the dirt so he can build you a new shop at the farm, right? Like the, all these things just uh, continue to add. What what do you make of the Saskatchewan government's position? And and we've had all this rhetoric from Ottawa uh, that it is anarchy and it's this and we'll see you in court. Where do things actually stand? Well, Saskatchewan led the charge on this. When there was, yeah. Mo pointed this out in a speech recently, when he was still environment minister before he became premier uh, and he was in a meeting where there was this, all the other province kind of agreed to go along with the federal carbon thing. And he walked out of that meeting and said, we're not doing it. And uh, so, you know, we, we led the fight in uh, all the way to Supreme court. We lost that. But the reality is, is that Saskatchewan has never wavered. They have said, we are not doing this. And because of the unique situation, because of uh, historically having socialist governments for most of our uh, last hundred years, there, we have a, a network of crown corporation utilities that yeah. still exist that have been div divested in other provinces. But so, this allows Saskatchewan to withhold, because I know the Premier of Alberta said, I wish we could do what Saskatchewan is doing, but we can't because we don't have crown corporations. So just explain that a little. Okay, so in Alberta, if I uh, getting my power, I'm my power bill might be uh, uh, ATCO or it might be uh, 
capital power. It's mm-hmm. a private corporation. Uh, where is as in Saskatchewan, all of my power, unless you're in Saskatoon, Saskatoon is a city of Sask- uh, Saskatoon has its own utility, but otherwise all the power in Saskatchewan is, uh, is done. The grid is done through SAS power, which generates wow. the bulk of it. They, yep. uh, and all the natural gas by law transmitted through pipelines, Saskatchewan all goes through Sask energy, which is crown corporation. And what a lot of people don't necessarily realize is that, and this has been definitely reinforced of this whole debate, the crown is the government. The government is the crown. Most people don't think of it that way. Mm-hmm. But that's really come to the fore with the whole legal stuff here. Is right. that, and because we have two sovereign levels of government, we have uh, you know, constitutional stuff. We've got the federal government and we've got the provincial government. Yep. One can't necessarily tell the other what to do. And that's what the Saskatchewan government has done is they've said, okay, we're taking all the responsibility that is being applied to this. We're putting it all on the minister responsible, who happens to be Dustin Duncan from uh, uh, Weyburn Big Muddy. And if anyone is to be uh, charged to go to carbon jail, as they're saying, it's mm-hmm. Dustin Duncan. He's going to t- He's going to be sacrificed on the carbon cross and he's going to, you know, be punished for our carbon sins. So he's the minister responsible for these two crown corporations. And the argument is, is that we're controlling this and we run it. This is the um, property of of the crown, meaning the government, meaning the government of Saskatchewan and the government of Ottawa can't say this is what you must do. This is something that's not usually seen in uh, Canadian politics. We don't usually have uh, provinces standing up and asserting what is constitutionally their right to do and and to be uh you know affirmative in that action usually provinces is kind of you know they they nod their head and they bow down right. to whatever the feds want and this is a rare thing and you know the, so the mo government's been doing that uh smith has been you know in lockstep with them uh some people think smith has been pushing harder i would say they're they're both pushing this really hard yeah. and you know, so, they're getting but some they support just don't from have the option to fight it on these grounds. This is, yeah. this is, and this will no doubt be challenged in the courts. Absolutely. But you know, yeah. the, this really comes down to the fact that if the Trudeau government had not given the, uh, the carbon tax, uh, carve out for Atlanta, you know, for people use heavy oil yeah. uh, for fuel, which I grew up with as a kid, uh, but it's almost entirely in Atlantic Canada. And if he didn't stand there and say it with all of his Atlantic caucus behind yeah. him, making it very clear it was a political issue. Yeah. If, if they had just left the carbon tax as is and let the Atlantic people pay it through the nose like they are, they, we wouldn't be here now. It, this is, yeah. uh, you know. No, it does seem to be a self-imposed uh, um you know, fight that is uh, is is certainly going to unfold. It's kind of like, uh, oh, this is back in the 70s before my time, but the conservative leader who fumbled the football. Yes. Uh, and, you know, never recovered from that. And this is, that was very much this moment to that. The, they, yeah. they uh, you know, they lost the ball. Yeah, self-inflicted wound. Okay, I want to come back to, so just to make sure that I've got, because the last time we talked, we were talking about all of the taxes. So there's the carbon tax and we've been focused on that and the increase goes into effect 23%. What about the clean fuel tax? Where are we with that? Honestly, I haven't heard much about that at all. That's one of those things they brought in and it's kind of, you know, we don't talk about that. It's there. It is the driving factor behind the, uh, uh, the development of additional canola crushing plants in Yorkton, in uh, Regina. Uh, if the clean fuel standard was there, those would not be happening. I tell you that. My mom is the closest neighbor to the ones in Yorkton. Like literally, uh, it's right across the tracks, about fifty yards away. So they are. That is driving that. So explain uh, that. There, it's driving what exactly? Well, the clean fuel standard wants to decarbonize fuels. Being right. that almost all fuels are made of hydrocarbons, that's akin to saying we're going to take the wa- the H two O out of water. Yeah, 
It's it's literally utter nonsense, but it's the the, the term decarbonize. You, so the idea is instead of uh, using fossil fuels such as oil or natural gas mm -hmm. or uh, gasoline, it's to use biological fuels, biofuels. So, so we're going to uh, take food sources like corn and all of that or canola waste and turn it into biofuels. Well, I wouldn't say it's canola waste. It's a canola. It's the prime product of the canola. It is. So, eh? Yeah. So I talked to a guy here a couple of years ago who was in charge of building a, one of these crushing plants. It didn't go ahead. But I asked him, is this being driven by a clean fuel standard? He said, absolutely. He, uh, basically in Saskatchewan, because of crop rotations, you can't grow yeah. canola every year. Yeah. About one third of uh you know, of our crops are canola and as a reason because it, it pays yep. among the best so people want to grow it as often as they can Absolutely, yeah and about half of that canola he figured is going to be going towards fuel so, so they're building these plants uh to create biofuels that will then i mean part of the, the where where i've read about this in the states though is it actually in places like Iowa and all of that, where they're they're taking corn crop, which is used for either human or animal feed, and taking it out of that system and then putting it in the biofuel system. So we're kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul. Yeah, absolutely. So where I was going with that example is that it works out to roughly one-sixth of Saskatchewan farmland will be used to grow fuel instead of food. Now, that, oh. that might be great. And that's just for the canola part. That's not on the, uh, yeah. the, yeah. Know, the wheat side. So, you know, that that's great from a ideological standpoint, but while the, there's still hungry people in the world, maybe we should be feeding them first when we have other sources of fuel. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyhow, so that that's driving the development of the stuff that's happening in North End of Regina, uh, these crushing plants. There is one of these taxes here I wanted to mention because this came yeah. up in provincial budget last week. So there's multiple forms of carbon tax, and one of them is called the output-based pricing system which yeah. does not roll off the tongue. No one thinks about <laughs> it. I hardly know about it, and I write about this stuff. <laughs> and it's basically the large emitters, the refineries, the power plants, and stuff like that, instead of paying the carbon tax the way we do for natural or gas bills, they pay it in that form. And it's and it's based on the per ton thing. <clears throat> so there was a uh, rule that came in that the federal government would allow provinces to keep that money if they had a system that the feds figured was equivalent to the federal system. Last fall, I think it was October, the Saskatchewan uh, system was approved by the federal government. Okay. Which means that the output-based pricing system, those dollars are not going to Ottawa. They're not going back in carbon rebate. They're going to the province of Saskatchewan, which showed up in its last budget as a half billion dollars of, of revenue. So the province has said, we're going to take that money. Yeah. Uh, and it's not going out and rebate checks, something like that. We're going to put some of it in a clean uh, technology fund. But a good chunk of that, we are going to put for small modular reactors. Okay. So and actually fund the nuclear uh, yeah. side. Of it. Yeah. So if you're looking at a half billion a, a year, you know, yeah. have, you know, uh, five, 10 years from now, you've got one reactor, which is, by the way, the timeline for the first reactor. But the other thing about that mm -hmm. is that that's based on the current carbon price. If the, if the, the, uh, liberal plan of hitting $170 a ton ever did happen, then that amount would basically go from half a billion a year to, I don't know, one and a half, something like that, yeah. which is a lot of money coming out of the Saskatchewan economy. Yeah. So are you suggesting that the, the, uh, that Ottawa might be looking at that as a way to punish Saskatchewan or rethinking that ruling, or you're just describing what Saskatchewan's doing with that money. That's what's, well, that's what's happened right now. I mean, yeah. I guess, you know, and that was just recently yeah, you know, given to Saskatchewan basically as a carrot. And, you know, I guess the federal government could always use it as a stick instead of a carrot. Yeah. All right. So um, the third uh, tax, which really impacts, I think, Alberta and other places more than us, but the clean electricity standard. Where are we on that? Because that's one of those hidden kind of behind the scenes thing. And it all has to do with where we want the electricity grid 
by 2035 um, and the pressure that's going to be on it if everybody is required to own an EV. So uh, about two months ago, I think it was just before Christmas, they released an updated version of these clean electricity regulations. I think mm -hmm. it came out like two days before Christmas. They wanted to bury it, if I recall. That actually has more impact on Saskatchewan than you can possibly imagine, because okay. on any given day, up to 89% of our power is coming from coal and natural gas. And the clean electricity regulations basically say that by 2035, you can't use fossil fuels unless you have carbon capture on it all. Uh, just yesterday, uh, and I haven't had a chance to write about this yet, Sask Power put out its long-term plans for power generation. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they said is that they're not planning on additional carbon capture for coal, which means effectively by 20, uh, December 31st, 2029, coal is dead. Unless there is a big change in Ottawa that changes the rules, coal is absolutely dead, which on any given day is up to 40% of our power. So we have to replace that. We've got to replace that lickety split. Now, the, yeah, uh, but can we? I mean, this is part of the debate we keep having. The timeline here is exceedingly short. It's impossible. It's a, it's utterly impossible. So, right now, it's I think this is third year of construction. They're they're just finishing up the Great Plains uh, power station in uh, uh, Boost Jaw, and it's three hundred seventy megawatts. So it's about a roughly equal to a quarter of our coal capacity, quarter to a third. So it will replace some of the coal stuff. It's they're in commissioning right now. Not near your place. They're going to be building one at Lanigan. Uh, okay. It's going to be called Aspen. It's going to be similar size, 370 megawatts. So that'll rep replace again another third of it. But that's just replacement. That's not, you know, accounting for growth. And the reality is that uh, 200 megawatts is going to be needed for BHP Jansen when it's up and running. Like just so to run one operation at just Jansen. One. Just one place. So it won't be just exclusively from that plant. They'll pull from, from the grid. But the fact that they're building it within spitting distance of that mine is yeah. no coincidence. But that's so, just a, a mine operation. That's not uh, the increase. I mean, all of the, the consumer demand that's there, as I say, including EVs, which is that's the other, uh, you know, order, which is it all has to be EV vehicles. Yeah. So, uh, so you're right. There, we are not building enough generation. There's no real talk about the transmission to handle all these extra electrons. And anyone who tells you wind, tell them this. On uh, Friday last week, yeah. the SAS Power puts out their numbers for on a 24-hour average. We have 617 megawatts of wind generation. We averaged 24 megawatts. And I so I asked SAS Power, so two questions I always ask them. Did we have any time where we had zero power? And did we have a time of less than 10 megawatts? It's 1.6%. We had less than 1.6% for 12 hours. And we had a full hour in a, at a few minutes of zero goose egg power from wind. So anyone who says we're going to build wind, we're going to build solar, and this earth keeps turning. Yeah. It's just, it's not feasible. So you have to build the base load. You have to build natural gas. The timelines to build nuclear the timelines. You're looking at from natural gas from start to finish, probably four years. Okay. Maybe three years if you really push it. Nuclear, decade, decade and a half from, you know, because uh, of all the assessments and the licensing the and regulatory everything else. process. Yeah. So we've got to go you know, you've got to really, really build these things out. Uh, and we're not. I mean, the plan that they have is not enough to go anywhere close yeah. to what the federal government says of needing to increase the grid by two and a half times. You know what I read the other day, Brian, and it just always strikes me is that 2023, we are still at peak oil consumption, um, not just in Canada, but pretty much in the world. Like we're still... We're, we're going to need this fuel source, this energy source for quite some time. Um, we, we don't have, you know, big semis going down the highways that are, you know, wind powered or solar powered, right? We're, we're, we're going to need this. And, and we're so focused on getting to point B, which I know we must do. 
But we're kind of losing sight is that we still live in this real world. And that part of the energy equation has to carry on. Well, one of the things I heard somewhere, I can't remember the source, but they said basically in the developing world, the uh, there's a very common pattern. As soon as people have the money to do it, the first thing they get is a, sm- a smartphone. Yeah. If they have nothing, if they have any money, they'll get a smartphone because that expands their everything they can do with it. Right. Next, they get air conditioning. And the third thing to do is to get a car. And as the developing world, you know, talking Africa, Asia, and everything, as they expand economically and come out of the depths of poverty, as the enormous quantity of people have in the last 20 years, they want vehicles. There yeah. is that is why demand is. I mean, you look at pictures of uh of uh Beijing, you don't see 10,000 bicycles in a uh street anymore. You see 10,000 cars. Yeah. No, that that demand is there. Now, I guess there was some recognition of this that uh and I and and you you've mentioned this about the provincial budget, not the federal budget, but kind of recognizing that the oil and gas industry is still alive and still needs to be um, uh, enticed to do what they do as long as we need their product. Yeah. So my lead story that came out this morning is uh, about the biggest change in royalties in Saskatchewan in roughly two decades. Uh, So for the the first uh, six years of Saskatchewan party government, Bill Boyd was minister of energy and he gave the same speech so many times I stopped taking notes. His speech was, uh, you know, the premier has told me to say thank you. Thank you for the jobs. Thank you for the royalties. Thank you for the taxes. And we're not changing a thing on royalties. Yeah. And uh, it made the that, world predictable for the energy sector. by ab- just Yeah. Stability, stability, stability. Now, most people think when you t- start talking about royalties, the automatic assumption is, well, the government's going to jack them up. That is not what happened on March 20th. Uh, What they've done is that there is a new pattern of drilling wells that is incredibly complex, that is revolutionary, that it's been, it's become very common in Northwest Alberta, a place called Clearwater. And it's been experimented with throughout different areas of Saskatchewan. And it has the potential to dramatically impact almost all oil production across the province. What do you mean? Like a new pattern? What What does it do? It literally is a pattern. So imagine. So I got my piece of paper here. Yeah. So typically <laughs> you drill a well, you come, yeah. you start from the surface, you come down and you go horizontal. Right. And this part here produces oil, the bottom part. Yeah. That's called a horizontal leg. Sometimes you'll do a second leg. Well, this is what the new ones look like. What, smaller legs and... No, legs. longer. Up to two oh, miles no. long. Okay, okay. And instead of one or two legs, eight, ten. Uh, there's another design that looks like this. So fewer wells, but more access underground. So yeah. the... Yeah. So the other one looks like this. Comes out here, and then it looks like a palm frond. You look like at any leaf, you see the veins on a leaf. Yep. So in Saskatchewan already, one company has drilled one of 39 of these legs. Wow. So the incentive so, here is that uh, we want companies to do more of this. This means less surface uh, stuff, but more underground. Exactly. It, it Get the oil out, but don't disrupt the surface and let and, communities carry on. So the biggest thing is what they call contact with the reservoir. What that means is the more we can touch the rock and more we can suck oil out of a rock, the better it is. Yeah. Uh, So generally when you're looking at a map of, you know, an an overhead map and you have, you know, section of land like this and you'll have, you know, one of those wells or two of those wells, what this basically does, it fills in it's like okay. you take a, a color a crayon, you're filling in the square. All right. So, so there uh, are some people, Brian, that only listen to us and don't watch it. So we're we're gonna put that. <laughs> put well, that basically, down. basically, what it comes down to is that <laughs> it you're filling in the square. You're dramatically, yeah. dramatically increasing the uh, capacity of these wells to produce yeah. oil. 
So and they're incentivizing that so that the the footprint will be smaller. The footprint will be smaller. Production will be bigger. Yeah. There's a much longer discussion about how it impacts services, but really Saskatchewan feels like it's losing out to Alberta. And if we don't get in on this game, we're going to yeah. lose. So they're incentivizing that. Well, very interesting to talk as always. So the rates are going up and I think at some point we'll come back to you in the summer. And because we have this discussion quite a bit about what the impact of this is on the agriculture sector too, of the carbon tax increases. We talked about it a bit today, but maybe we'll do that in our next lesson from Brian Zinchuk, the energy nerd. Uh, oh, maybe geek <laughs> might be better. <laughs> okay. You Either like way. geek better. Okay. You got to make up your mind. If I'm All right. Sounds good. All right. Brian Zinchuk, the editor and owner of Pipeline Online. You know what? We didn't even talk about the pipeline that's starting to produce. Oh, well, you know, I, I know someone who's worked on that all the way from 2018. Yes. And, you know, it was looking like it was never going to get finished, but he actually, he, uh, he went home this last weekend. He fought so that job is pretty much wrapped for him. So something is actually going to go through that pipeline. Well, they were having some real problems in Southern BC. Uh, yeah. They may be close to resolving it. I kind of wasn't very hopeful before, but now it looks like, well, there actually might be light at the end of a tunnel and it's okay. the pipe going through the tunnel. Okay. We are going to do pipelines and farms next time we talk. Thanks so much, Brian. Thank you. Good to talk to you. That is it for this edition of No Nonsense with Pamela Wallen. We'll see you very soon. <laughs>